1916, Lewis Fry Richardson, who'd been a meteorologist before the war, uh, was an uh, ambulance uh, stretcher bearer uh, in the, on the Western Front. He was a Quaker and a pacifist, so he didn't want to be in the part of the fighting, but he wanted to help. Um, but he'd also been working on the weather before the war, and he thought it would be possible to predict the weather by calculating it, that is, by treating it as a mathematical problem. So he gathered lots and lots of data from across Europe based on uh, the weather on a single morning. And then he spent uh, months, in fact, with a pencil and a piece of paper calculating what would happen uh, over the course of that day. And it took him about four months to perform a single one-day weather forecast for the whole of Europe. But he was broadly correct. And he was the first person to see uh, this section of the natural world as something that could be reduced to data, computed um, and projected into the future. And that's kind of what we've based a huge amount of 20th century thought on. It's what I would call computational thinking. This belief that the world can be reduced to data, uh, can be modelled, can be completely understood. Um, it descends from the Enlightenment, the belief that if we could only know more about the world, uh, we'd have in, uh, more control over it. Unfortunately, it seems increasingly apparent that that belief is failing. It's one of the central paradoxes of our age that we know more and more about the world, more and more information is available to all of us, um, and yet the world seems mostly characterised by division, by fundamentalism, by these competing incredibly toxic opinions, that more information, more data about the world isn't helping us to resolve it in any way. And you can see this even in the weather, in, in that thing that Lewis Fry Richardson first calculated, turned into something that was computable, um, because even our weather predictions are starting to, to fail us now. We're, we can gather so much information about the world, but the world is outrunning us, um, particularly as a result of climate change. Uh, the weather is becoming so chaotic that our ability to predict is actually reducing. Uh, over the last century, we've got out to about a week or 10 days ahead. Uh, that horizon is now uh, coming back towards us. So we face a future in which we have ever more data about the world, um, and yet we know ever less about it. And that is a core character of a, a new dark age. There's this idea that if we could just gather more and more information about the world, we'd, we'd have uh, this complete overview of it. That's ultimately what big data is. It's this view that you can get so much information that you have a total view, and you produce a kind of perfect model of the world. And then instead of looking at the world, you look at the model and it tells you everything. But actually the last hundred years of computation shows us every time that the model isn't good enough. That when we try to use it instead of the world, it, it continues to fail. That big data is always, always insufficient. And it's often overwhelming too. So it feels like we have no control. So it both doesn't work and it demoralizes us. So recently there was an analysis of a piece of software in the US which was helping or supposed to help judges with sentencing requirements. So when someone was convicted in court, this computer program would suggest how long they should go to jail for. And after quite a lot of analysis, it seemed to show that actually this piece of software was, was racially biased. It was giving uh, people of colour longer sentences, more punitive sentences than it was giving to white people. Um, and this surprised a lot of people, not all, but some who believe that software is somehow neutral, right? that technology is, is a levelling force, that it's kind of, it actually makes us more equal and, and um, uh, allows us to make better, more equitable decisions about the world. Unfortunately, that's really rarely the case, not least because the only thing software has to look at is what we're doing already. So we're building expert systems based on our own history, and unfortunately our own history is massively racist and prejudiced in a whole kind of bunch of other ways. Um, as a result, like, what's incredibly necessary in this field is uh, a massive democratization of this, these technologies. Uh, rather than being built purely by, by um, technologists uh, with a particular kind of expert skill, but not so much um, kind of social and historical knowledge, um, these technologies need to be opened up to wider and wider access so they're actually more representative of a, of a, a wider uh, population and possibility. So in 1997 there's this uh, amazing chess game between Garry Kasparov and Deep Blue. Uh, the, probably the greatest chess player humanity's ever produced versus a computer that IBM has built explicitly to beat him. And when he loses, um, it's regarded as a kind of terrible thing for human intelligence and understanding and, and the machines are going to take over and all of that. But what's 
interesting is that we do know how Deep Blue ca beat Kasparov. We understand the process that happened there. Uh, this was a very powerful machine. It could think many, many moves ahead and it could store all those outcomes in a huge index and it could just look them up and therefore kind of uh, it outpowered Kasparov, but it didn't outthink him and we understand the process that happened there. What's deeply strange is that when there was a kind of repeat of this last year in the match between Lisa Doll and AlphaGo, um, playing a different game, playing Go, which requires a different kind of thinking. Um, there's a moment in the third game when this strange computer, AlphaGo, plays a move against Lee Sadol that, that surprised everybody. Sadol actually leaves the room for about half an hour. It made the commentators go silent because they didn't understand why the machine had played this move. It seemed completely weird and crazy. Um, AlphaGo went on to, to destroy that game, to, to win utterly. Um, and now that move is regarded as one of the most extraordinary moves in the history of Go. But because of the way AlphaGo works, which is what we call machine learning, which is what we call a type of artificial intelligence, um, the way that it works means that we don't understand why the machine made that move. We will never understand how AlphaGo came to make the decision to make that move. So unlike in the game with Kasparov, where we can follow step by step the processes that Deep Blue made, in order to make its decisions. We're now entering a time when machines are making decisions that we don't understand why they're making those decisions or how they came to those conclusions, which puts humanity in a, in a very strange existential place where our machines are, are not just uh, thinking ahead of us, they're thinking so radically differently to us that we're never going to be able to follow their thought processes. This whole other form of intelligence is starting to emerge um, and this may be a herald of a new dark age in which we are ever less powerful. It also might be a time of, of increased augmentation uh, where we're actually able to collaborate with this intelligence in new ways. But that's really a political question as well. This isn't a question just for technologists, it's a question for all of us. What do we want these technologies to do? How can we understand them and actually put them to our service rather than having them used against us? It's weird that we seem to live in a world where most of us don't really have a sense of how most of the things around us work. And that's a relatively new condition. You know, you ask most people how the postal system works and you get a relatively reasonable explanation. You, you write a letter, you put an envelope, you write an address on the front, you put the stamp on, you put it in a box, someone comes and takes it to the other place. That's a totally reasonable explanation. You ask most people how email works and that whole thing just kind of falls apart. And you suddenly realize that so many of the systems we encounter every day are, are completely mysterious to us, that they, they behave almost like a kind of magic or they appear so. Um, the thing is, they're not magic and, and, and they have ways of working. But if we don't understand how those systems function, um, if we don't understand how they all interconnect, if we don't understand who has power within those systems, then we have no way of affecting them and we're, we're essentially um, without agency and have no power to direct them. There's a very strange thing that happens uh, with advanced technologies and, and particularly with network technologies is that they get kind of hidden away behind glass. Um, they become hidden within themselves so that we no longer have, have access to them. Um, but something equally extraordinary happens the other way around, which is as if you do start to understand them a little bit, if you can read a little bit of the way in which those technologies function, all of these power relationships become incredibly clear and readable and can actually be critiqued and addressed in new ways. We often think of the internet as some sort of like magical faraway place where all this stuff just gets happens and, and beams down to us. But in many ways, it's super physical. There's big buildings on the edge of cities filled with computers wiring away and generating loads of heat and taking in loads of electricity. And there's cables that run under the ocean uh, connecting everything up. If you look at a map of where the internet's fiber optic cables go, for example, you'll see that they actually trace out completely the roots of uh, former empires. So all the fiber optic cables from Africa still root back to their former colonial powers. Uh, loads of the ones from South America still go back to Spain. Uh, and this is because actually, in many ways, imperialism didn't stop with decolonization. It just kind of moved up to the infrastructure level. So if you're capable of seeing some of these technologies, you can work out where the power still lies and start to address them. A few years ago, I was doing a project tracking secret deportation flights, which are charter flights that go out in the middle of the night uh, from airports around London carrying deportees home. Um, and these were quite hard to find, but they were there. You could go out and looking for them. You could stand in fields and see them. Uh, and one day I was standing in a field watching one of these flights um, when I got talking to someone else who was also looking at the skies. 
uh, and they were looking at the same planes as I was and, and the same sky, and yet they were seeing something totally different. Uh, they were seeing a huge, vast conspiracy involving uh, the chemical, uh, the release of chemicals from planes to drug people or to confuse them or to change the weather. Uh, this is a huge internet conspiracy theory called chemtrails, uh, which is so kind of vast and uh, all-encompassing that it might be considered almost the kind of first folk literature of the internet. Um, in fact, conspiracy theory seems to be the most kind of powerful narrative form of our time. Um, and I think that's because the world has become so extraordinarily complex. Um, it's incredibly difficult now to write simple stories about the world, which is what we all yearn to hear. And that, that desire for simple stories lies behind both the rise of conspiracy theory, but also the rise of kind of populist politics and of fundamentalisms. Uh, as more and more information is made available to us, the world actually appears to be more and more confusing. So we fall back onto these simple narratives um, that often result in um, kind of misunderstandings and even violence because they're unable to accommodate the world as it is. Conspiracy theories are, in the sense, one of these symptoms of a new dark age where we constantly demand to be given a single answers to these incredibly complex global problems. And until we figure out ways in which we can regard the world as something that's, that's ongoing, uh, that's a process of constant negotiation, rather than the provision of kind of computational solutions to every single problem, we're continually going to run into these, these deep conflicts, uh, debates and, and, and violent arguments. So we're in this position where we've kind of completely undermined any possible trust in, in traditional sources of authority, whether that's politics or the media. But we've also spent the last kind of 50 years undercutting our own understanding of the world by making technology and, and the systems around us ever more opaque. So we're in this sudden position of having no, no authority, but also no um, ability to make critical judgments ourselves. So we're at this absolutely crucial moment where we need to kind of rapidly develop our tools of, of understanding and thinking the world in, in a, an entirely different way to make up for this shortfall of uh, authority on the one hand and a complete collapse of understanding on the other.